Uh, good evening, everyone. I will call the August 12th work session to order and request a roll call, please. Mr. Hamas? Here. Mr. Bush? Here. Ms. Hamas, Vice President Darrell, are starting the school year 2019 through the 2022 school year. I just want to talk about a little bit of background, the process we went through, and then our goals for the plan. So just some background. Um, so we did three years ago create what we call the technology roadmap. So this kind of where what we call the roadmap because we wanted to see where we are and where we want to go. Um, and we use this diagram that you're looking at as that as that map. And the, the important part of this Background is that foundation, the infrastructure and support. So the last three years, we've spent a lot of time and energy focusing on improving, updating the infrastructure and support that we have in the district. Um, we've added, we've replaced the Wi-Fi in all the buildings. Um, we've tripled our bandwidth over the last three years. Um, we've replaced servers. We've upgraded our virtual server environment. So we've added over 300 security cameras across the district. So a lot of time, effort, uh, money has been spent on um, really getting that infrastructure solid. So as you can see on our roadmap diagram, that without that solid infrastructure, nothing above it is gonna work. Um, without that basis, that foundation, then uh, we struggle with everything above it. Um, we also focused on, especially the last couple of years, devices that we have in the classrooms. Um, we added a lot of Chromebooks to support online testing over the last few years. We've replaced staff computers, and then recently, most recently, we replaced the classroom AV setup in there. So we've done a lot of device updates over the last few years. And again, that wasn't possible without first addressing the infrastructure, um, getting that up to speed. And then also software. So with new devices comes new software. Um, computer software is pretty much the same, just updating that. But we have um, added several other online systems that teachers can log into. Um, we've made our learning management system, Schoology, more robust. We've integrated things a little better. And then with the addition of iPads last year for students, obviously we have um, a lot of apps that they can use uh, to be a little more creative, a little more collaborative in their learning experiences. So lots of things we've done over the last three years um, was based on that roadmap we created in 2016. So we're at the place now where, where we're at a, at a good, solid foundation in the software device and infrastructure, we can really focus on the learning pieces. So we can really focus on what's going on in the classroom. Um, and that's a lot of what this plan deals with, um, in addition with the other parts of the, of, of the roadmap. So that's just a little bit of the background. You've heard me talk about that in the past. Um, again, that was done in 2016, and we spent three years working on those things. So the planning process. Um, what we did this spring, we got a group of teachers, administrators, support staff together, and we met five, uh, well, five times over five weeks. And we had a lot of discussions about what we, what we wanted to see in our classrooms when it comes to learning and teaching and the use of technology. So we started with our beliefs. So beliefs are based on what we have experienced, what we've observed in our, in our lives, in our professional life and personal life. They're not necessarily based on facts, they're just what we believe based on our experiences. So you can imagine a large group of people when you're talking about what you believe in terms of learning and teaching and technology, you get a lot of things listed there. So we spent weeks just going through this list and kind of tearing it down to something manageable. You can see in the handouts you have the beliefs that are outlined there. From the beliefs, then we look at our values. So values are a little more abstract. They're bigger than beliefs. Our values are based on our beliefs. 
um, but not a concrete. Um, and they, he said, they, they stem from our belief system. So we talk about our value, what we value in terms of learning, teaching, and technology. And then we talk about behaviors. The behaviors that we see in our classrooms with students and teachers are all stem, they all stem from our values. So when you look at someone's behavior in a classroom, when you look at their behavior with technology, you can tell what they value. So your values lead to your behaviors. So we spent a lot of time just talking about those things, of what we believe in, um, what we valued, and then what types of behaviors that we want to see when it comes to learning and teaching. So you've got the list in front of you in the handout, but I'll highlight just a few of our beliefs um, because these, these really have to do more with learning and teaching than technology specific. Um, but for example, we believe that the use of technology should be intentional, focused, and purposeful. So in other words, we don't want teachers to use technology just for the sake of using technology. That doesn't help the learning process. It should be intentional and focused. Uh, we believe technology is a tool, not a learning outcome. So just like papers, pencils, crayons, chalkboards are tools that have traditionally been in classrooms, now technology is just one more tool that we can put in the classroom to help the learning process. But it itself is not a magic bullet. A hammer doesn't automatically pound the nail. A hammer is a tool to accomplish something. Technology is a tool to accomplish something in the classroom. So we believe that technology is a tool, not a learning outcome. We believe learning how to effectively use technology is critical for our students' future success in life. So the world we live in today is very technology-based. Just being exposed to technology, using it in a productive way, helps our students in their future. And you can see there's other beliefs in there. Some have to do with um, supporting staff. Some have to do with the, just the IT infrastructure, the network speed, and those things. So those are things, again, we have a long list of beliefs, and these are then pared down to these are the most common ones, the, the most important ones that we felt as a group. So then those led us to a discussion about our values. So again, values are based on our beliefs. They're more abstract, they're kind of broader in concept. Um, and they, they lead to our behaviors. So some things that we value, um, a supportive, collaborative learning culture, intentional, purposeful learning experiences, uh, we value digital wellness, we value quality professional development, a lot of other things that are in there. But those were, looking at our list of beliefs, then we decided that these were the, the common threads in there. These were our values when it comes to learning, teaching, and just the general use of technology in our school district. So from the values, then we, we go to our vision. So you can imagine, again, we have 30-ish people working together over five weeks. We've got this long list of beliefs, long list of values, and we need to come, we need to pare it all down to one vision statement. So again, this is a lot of conversation. What are the critical words? How do we summarize these weeks of conversation? So the vision statement we came up with. Our learning community supports a healthy environment that embraces authentic, creative, and collaborative learning both inside classrooms and beyond. So one thing to note about our vision statement, it doesn't have the word technology in there. And that was intentional. And we talked a lot about that. Because we really felt, again, one of our core beliefs was technology is just a tool, not a learning outcome. So we really wanted the vision to be about learning and teaching. We really wanted it to be about the experiences our students and teachers have. And technology is just a means to get there. So this is really as much of a learning and teaching vision statement as it is a technology vision statement. Because that's, again, that's the whole reason we put technology in schools is to enhance learning and teaching. Not just to use technology, not just to have it say we're one to one with iPads. It's what are we gonna do with it? So we took the vision a little bit further, a little bit like our statement of purpose as a district, and we defined some things. Because a lot of things we start to put in phrases or words in there, they can be taken a lot of different ways. So we want to make sure that everyone was on the same page with our, our definitions in those terms. So you can see we define the learning community as the New Albany, uh, sorry, our students, teachers, administrators, support staff, parents, local and global partners. So it is everybody involved with our students and teachers in the classroom. Support, it's the resources, the professional development, the funding to achieve the vision. So support means a lot of things, both fiscally 
and kind of manpower coaching up, teaching both our teachers and our students. Healthy, we, we define that as social, emotional, physical, digital wellness. So a lot of focus on social, emotional learning in our district. Um, and we need to also focus on the physical and digital wellness um, as well going forward. Authentic, obviously it's gonna be a relevant learning experience. Creative, we talked about solving problems in unique ways, designing original products, um, allow learners to express their creativity. Collaborative, um, helping each other to grow by working together. And classroom is an easy one. It's the classroom, it's the physical space in our buildings. Then beyond is everything outside the classroom. So we wanted to have that in there, learning both inside and outside the classroom, because learning shouldn't stop when you leave the room. Learning should be a continual process. It should continue at home. It should continue with your friends. It should continue on sports, the athletic field. Learning is beyond the classroom. So we wanted to make sure that that was included in there. So our vision statement, pretty simple in terms of, of number of words as one sentence, but the definition kind of adds a little bit more meat to that um, by making it clear what we mean in the vision statement. So from there, we, we set our goals. So keep in mind that we set a vision statement. So a vision isn't defining where we are today. The vision is where we want to be by 2020. So in order to get, in order to achieve our vision, we have to set some goals. So these goals are over the course of three years. They're not gonna all be done at the end of this year. They're not gonna all be done by the end of next year. But by the end of 2022 school year, we should hopefully accomplish our, all of our goals. And if we do, then we believe that we have achieved our vision. So the first goal, maintain information technology infrastructure that's able to support a one-to-one -one learning environment. So we seem to keep our eye on the ball, make sure that our network is robust, make sure our bandwidth is capable of handling things, make sure that our systems are talking to each other. We need to make sure that that base of the foundation stays solid, and we don't let that just wither over time. Goal two, provide opportunities that help all administrators, teachers, support staff, develop their skills to work more effectively and efficiently through the use of technology. So we want to focus on, on the staff. We want to make sure they know how to use all the new tools that we have. If they don't know how to use it, then they won't be able to translate that and transfer it to the students. And then goal three, we want to raise awareness for the need to develop a balanced and healthy digital lifestyle. So more and more in this world, the more technology we get in the, in the hands of students, it becomes more critical that we teach them that balance, that digital wellness side of things. Um, it's the, just because you can doesn't mean you should mentality that we need to get in front of them. So those are our three goals. Um, so by themselves, they're, they're very broad. So we broke those down with action steps. So goal one has several action steps to it. Again, I won't go to all the details of these. Um, and I guess one thing to keep in mind when we look at some of these action steps, we, we actually um, finalized the, the process back in the spring, so in May. So some of these action steps that I'll, I'll show you in goal one specifically, we've already been done this summer. They were on our plans and we accomplished them already. So the first action step, um, create a, a, a projected budget over the next three years. So that's what we'll work with the treasurer's department see where's our five year forecast, what's it look like, what can we afford, and those are things that we've talked about in the past in our one-to-one -one plan. We've already budgeted for that, we've already planned for it, it's just revisiting that and making sure that, that we're not missing something and that we stay fiscally responsible. Um, upgrade the wireless after primary school. That was actually done this summer, it was one thing that we did this summer. Had a second ISP, again that was another thing we did this summer, um, that just gives us a little more um, redundancy in case one provider goes down, we can stay online with the other provider. Update the web filter and monitoring system, so we've got plans for doing those things. Um, do a security audit. We actually went through the audit in early summer. Now we're at the point of looking at the recommendations and seeing what we can do in the short term and long term um, to beef up our security, our cyber security. Implement offsite backup disaster recovery, continuity of services and provide training and resources for the IT staff. So goal one is more of an IT goal. Again, keep the, the base of the foundation solid so things can move on. And you can see, 
we got the action steps listed, and then how we're going to measure the success of that action step. So this just becomes our department goals over the next three years. Um, and again, some of those we've already started, some was accomplished already, and some we've got plans to move forward in the future. So goal one is more IT. Goal two is um, provide opportunities to help administrators, teachers, support staff develop their skills. So this is about professional development. Again, from the technology department standpoint, we focus on the professional development of our staff because then they transfer those skills to the students. So we don't directly involve, the department isn't directly involved with the students, we're involved with the staff, and then we help them transfer their skills to the students. So again, I, I won't read through all the details of these, but you can see our action steps, uh, starting with the needs assessment. So it's one thing to offer professional development, but it's, also, it's another completely different thing to offer it on what they need. So we can provide a needs assessment survey and decide where where do we need to target our professional development for staff um, so they can get the skills that they need. Um, provide uh, professional development specific to a one-to-one -one environment. So just using technology is different than teaching in the classroom that's one-to-one. -one. It's a, if you ask teachers that have been through it, they will tell you that it's just a different world um, when the kids all have a device. Um, professional development in our, in our LMS, our learning management system, um, look to see if we can purchase professional, some third parties to come in and offer and deliver professional development. Um, and then do some online PD, and then look at the possibility of hiring um, two or more technology coaches. So obviously that has to fit within our staffing plan, so there's conversations that have to happen, um, but it's something that we saw as a committee that we need to at least explore. So then goal three, was to raise awareness of um, a healthy digital lifestyle. So this is where we want to create a digital wellness framework. And we actually started working with this, um, working with several other Central Ohio school districts and WOSU, formerly ISCO, um, to develop this digital wellness framework. And along with that, we want to develop resources, resources for administrators, teachers, students, and parents that they can use to help raise awareness and help reinforce a healthy digital lifestyle with our students. So again, all of our action steps have measurements of success with them, um, and we'll just go through those um, and see what we can accomplish each year, and, and hopefully then by the end of the 2022 school year, we've accomplished our goals by achieving our action steps, and at that point, we believe that we would have achieved that vision that we set for learning and teaching with technology in our school districts. So, this time, I invite any questions, comments. Thanks for the presentation, Michael. Um, I had a, I did have a question about, and I see that you had a really great group of parents and teachers and administrators involved. Yeah, so, just, so the, the parents weren't involved back in the committee work, but we did invite them what, in our draft of the plan to give us feedback. So then I actually reformatted and redeveloped the plan after the feedback. And then we did some digital back and forth with parents. Okay. Yeah, my, my question is really around goal number two and the, um, the training that you have offered during the summer and maybe we'll offer going forward. Is the, tech, is the technology training in terms of how to use the technology or is it also integrated with the delivery of curriculum in the context of the new technology? Because I think that's what I hear from parents use more technology, transfer to one-to-one, -one. are we getting the same content to our students? Is it better, is it working better? Do our, do our teachers need more training? Do we right. offer enough training? And I guess so, my question is around. So it's, the answer is both. Um, so when we deployed the new devices to teachers, so when we handed the iPad Pros to teachers, we did device-specific hardware software training. Here's how you use this app, here's how you use this. So that's more of the what I would call training of how to use certain things, just so that they're able to function with the device. And then in the summer, we offered um, close to 20 different workshops, and those were more how to apply it in your classroom. So you know how to use the iPad, you know how to use this app or that app, but how are you gonna apply it so that your students are using it in a productive, relevant way? Because we do want 
like like our beliefs and values go, you do want the use to be productive, relevant, all of those things. And a lot of the emphasis was on FPD, um, but professional development about applying it is sometimes no technology is the right answer. So it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish that day with the student and don't force the technology in where it doesn't need to be forced in. So, so it's a little bit of both. It is the device and software specific, but then also how are you gonna apply it with your third graders, seventh graders, ninth graders? Follow up to that, because uh, it was one of my questions too. Um, how are, how do we, how are you determining, or what's the process for determining the effectiveness of the digital devices in the classroom? Maybe that's not necessarily a question for you, but for others. But how, how do we know that using the technology is working? Yes, yeah, so we, we have done these surveys with um, both students and staff through, we did a baseline last year about the, the use of technology from the student standpoint. Um, and then I think the plan is to follow up to see from there what, what changes we see. Changes in both attitude with technology and just the use and the practical use of it. Um, but I think it's important to note that, that technology is not a magic bullet. It's not gonna make us the best district out there. It really does come down to that application from the student and teacher um, perspective. And it, you know, looking at it from that lens of, is it just another tool that we're making available? And that tool can do a lot with us. It's not a magic bullet. It, it has to be intentional, purposeful, it has to be relevant. So those are the conversations we're at at this point. I think last year, um, I think to the credit of the teachers that were one-to-one -one last year, they used technology a lot, but I think they, um, I think they were so excited about they used it maybe too much. Uh, and that's where we're at now, where let's just take, take a step back and let's say, is this focused, relevant, purposeful use? And if so, then, then keep going. If not, then let's, let's make the best lesson that we can with or without technology. So you, um, you mentioned training, I, I, and refresh my memory, with our, with, with the purchase contract of the iPad, isn't there some ongoing training available for people? Yep, so both last year and this year um, included in our purchase with the Apple devices, the 34 days of professional development provided by Apple. So they come in and it's a variety of things. They'll work with administrators to kind of see what their goals are. They'll work with departments or grade levels or small groups to train them on just different things. But then they also work with individual teachers to create lesson plans and actually are in the classroom with them while they're teaching and working with the kids. So it's a variety of things. So last year and this year, we both had 34 days from Apple. Michael, we did a uh, community survey earlier in the year and we had the results for your committee. Was there anything that jumped out of that part of that survey that worked its way into your, your I, I think a lot of it, um, a, lot, a lot of concern about screen time. Um, so I think that's where our digital wellness, where we really want to focus on raising the awareness. And it's, we use the word raise awareness versus try to accomplish because a lot of it is kind of out of our hands. It's like the home life, the individual student. But raise awareness of digital wellness. So what is good screen time versus bad screen time? Just sitting and vegging on Netflix, not so productive. But reading a book on the iPad versus reading hard copy, um, doing something instructionally creative on the iPad, those would be good uses of screen time um, that cognitively can help the students develop versus just the passive sitting and consuming. That, but, so that was one thing that came through in the survey a lot was the, the concern about screen time. So I think we can hopefully address that with our digital wellness goals. Um, I think other uses were just, I think Mr. President McFarlane mentioned just the amount of use, not necessarily screen time, just using it for everything. And that's where we have to go back to that purposeful, intentional use of it, not just we have it, let's use it every day, all day. One quick foundation, like go back to the foundation. I'm just curious. Um, I mean, obviously a, a network like we have here is much different than you know, just getting your internet plugged in at home. Mm -hmm. But, um, with, with the, I, I know, I think in certain parts of New Albany already, you have AT&T coming in with fiber, so we got one gig coming through, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So speeds increase, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's more available bandwidth, it's faster. Right. Um, but what are some of the, I guess, concerns that you might have about just the way that technology is advancing and growing and the ability to kind of keep up with that? I mean, obviously you're planning for it, but anything that that is something that may actually not be something that you can plan for in the budget? Um, plan for everything. There's no surprise with the technology right. at all. Um, yeah, I, I think I think bandwidth is, is kind of the, always the unknown. You know, um, when I was at my previous district um, 10 years ago, we had 50, uh, 50 gigabytes, no, 50 megabytes of megabits per second of bandwidth. So here we have 1,500 megabits per second of bandwidth. So in the course of 10 years, a district that was four times the size of New Albany at 50, to New Albany today at 1,500, um, bandwidth usage just, it just, it surprises you. Because when you think you plan for it, we have, like I said, 1,500 now, we had 1,000 last year. I think we're gonna be good, but if we stream more digital content, if more stuff is online, we could be surprised with just the amount. And that's where designing a network with two ISPs design it so that we can maybe control the traffic or prioritize this over that. Um, then we can survive until we can afford to increase it. So I think bandwidth is always going to be the unknown there. The other thing, in our district we have a 10 gigabit um, per second fiber network, our own, our own fiber, but it's not the fiber that's necessarily the problem, it's the endpoint, it's what it's connected to. So our switches, our routers, those have one gigabit connection. So it's 10 gigabit fiber, but the one gigabit connection. So now we're getting to that point where if we maxed out our 1500, our one gigabit connections aren't gonna handle all that traffic. So it's just looking at those things, upgrading endpoints to 10 gigabit endpoints. Um, possibly there is some fiber updates we have to do. Um, it's just, um, 20 years old, we need to look at different ways of doing it.
Um, it was a time that we were giving the test, but we weren't using it to guide instruction. We weren't using it to pull intervention. So it was one of those decisions that we made of, is this the best assessment for our particular students that spring? Um, so we backed off on the number of times we offer the math assessment for the middle school um, using this kind of process with these three questions. So when we look at this college entrance exam and our choice between ACT and SAT, um, we really want to say, what is the purpose? Well, when we look at ACT and SAT, they've both been modified over the years. They really have the same goal in mind. They have the same purpose, which is a prediction for um, how a student will do in their freshman year. So if a student scores a college readiness benchmark, whether it be on the ACT or the SAT, um, there is a 75% prediction that they will earn a C or higher in that freshman level class. So when you look at these ACT, SAT, the purpose is really the same. And so we have to give one. So what makes the difference? Why choose one over the other? And it really comes down to this idea of how are we using our assessments? And this is really where the ACT and the SAT start to diverge um, in how we're able to use the information that we get from the ACT or the SAT. Um, we give the ACT to juniors, we've given it the last three years, and typically in February and March. Scores come back in April or May, so back to the district. They come back sooner to the students. Um, we get them after the students do. Um, and then it's the end of their junior year. They're applying for colleges come September. We may or may not be able to help move them towards that college readiness benchmark because of when that assessment is. We do give the pre-ACT as freshmen, or we have given the pre-ACT as freshmen for the last several years. Um, it is a modified version of the ACT, but we give it as freshmen, and it really isn't a good predictor um, in terms, of, it is a predictor, we just haven't used it very well in terms of looking at it for college readiness. So when you look at SAT, where, like I said, pre-ACT has the pre-ACT nine, and then the ACT we give the junior year. The SAT actually is an entire suite of assessments. It starts in the eighth grade. Um, there's a PSAT 8, a PSAT 9, PSAT 10, 11, and then you give the SAT and then the end of their junior year. All of these assessments are vertically aligned. So if you take um, the PSAT 8, the score that you received on that PSAT 8 can be correlated directly to a score on the SAT. So, if you look at the college readiness benchmarks, 480 for English and 530 for math, they scaled it back so we can see what those college readiness benchmarks would be on any of the assessments from 8 through PSAT 11. So what happens is we now have markers starting in 8th or 9th grade depending on when we give the assessment to college readiness benchmarks and the reporting that comes out of SAT allows us to do a deeper dive and say, okay, what are some of those areas that our students need to be, uh, need additional support on? In addition, the SAT, um, English writing and re English reading and writing is actually more closely aligned to the Ohio standards than the ACT. So the SAT is directly aligned to um, the Common Core framework um, common Core standards. While Ohio doesn't use exactly the, Ohio, the Common Core standards, they are a framework and there's a greater correlation. And so what you see is students are um, across the state have higher college readiness benchmark scores on the SAT than they do in the ACT. In addition, um, starting with the PSAT 8, there is actually an AP potential report. So from our scores that we receive from students that take the PSAT, we can see how likely um, will they do in an AP course. Um, and we offer a wide variety of AP classes so we can potentially look at students that may not um, sign up for AP and say, you want to know what, you really do have the potential to take this class. So it's additional information that we can use from the assessments. So for 1920, with this idea of um, how our assessments are being used, the PSAT is given in October of every year as a national assessment. This year it's October 16th. We would give the PSAT to 9th, 10th, and 11th graders. In December, students receive their scores. 
um, student assistance scores um, electronically for College Board. Um, the district then receives scores as well through a score report. Um, typically, after students um, receive their scores. And what's nice about um, the PSAT is students can take their scores directly into Khan Academy. Um, and what happens is when you put your PSAT scores into Khan Academy, it gives you a personalized learning module um, for the SAT. So a junior in January sits down, they put their PSAT scores into Khan Academy. From January to April, students are able to go through those modules um, that are personalized based upon their scores um, prior to them sitting for the SAT in April. Um, students that consistently use Khan Academy, it's about 10 to 15 minutes a day um, per area. So you think about um, anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes for both math and ELA. On average, scores go up 100 to 200 points. And then the SAT school day um, would be in April. Um, it was actually lands on one of the state testing days. And so um, when we talked about a modified testing calendar prior, um, the juniors would be sitting and taking the SAT on one of the days that freshmen and sophomores would be taking a state test. So when we talk about the CIP and we look at benchmark four, we want to graduate students who are college and career ready. So this is our long-term goal. We want to have we want to increase our number of students that are college and career ready. So we want to be able to show increased scores of those um, college readiness benchmarks, that 580 and the 430, or 530 and the 480. Um, when we look at this and the new graduation requirements um, that came out for the class of 2023, one of the um, new graduation requirements are seals. Students are to earn certain seals, whether it be um, a biliteracy seal, a Ohio means job seal. One of them is actually a college readiness. So one of the seals that students can earn on their diploma is whether or not, whether or not they've met the college readiness scores on the ACT or SAT. So when we look at the suite of assessments, it allows us um, to start tracking and to start monitoring and start helping support students um, earn those college readiness scores. Um, because this is a change, there needs to be some support for teachers. Um, we've been giving the ACT. The ACT is a common um, assessment. The language is pretty much um, known. Um, so looking at teachers, I actually am starting tomorrow, um, just talking about what is the difference between ACT, SAT, um, when scores come back, have conversations about what those scores look like. Um, there is significantly more reporting um, through the College Board's uh, online portal that actually um, provides item analysis. So in addition to um, how they're doing on brand specific questions and how their students did on those questions, counselors, um, additional support for counselors um, with those AP potential reports and how are we using those um, PSAT scores starting in the ninth grade. And lastly, helping parents understand the difference between ACT and SAT. Um, you know, SAT was once known as a, a post assessment. It really isn't anymore. It's accepted at all public schools in the state of Ohio, along with um, the majority, I think there's only a handful, less than five that do not accept that public, or I'm sorry, private universities that do not accept that SAT. So just kind of helping them understand the difference between the ACT and the SAT. So at this time, I'll open the floor for any questions or comments. I see that the grade eight is also a potential. We're starting with grade nine, so our ninth graders will take this in October. Is that our, ninth, our current ninth graders will take it in October. Yeah. And is the eighth graders do they have an option to take it on their own, or how does that? That is still is an ongoing conversation. Um, the PSAT 8 is not a national assessment. We can offer it at any time. Um, there are some blackout weeks that we're not allowed to give it, but we can pretty much give the PSAT 8 anywhere from September to April, end of April. Um, it's been an ongoing conversation with um, Ms. Dr. Hamilton and Ms. Isabella at the middle school. Just a 
little bit more about what you're describing out saying, you know, what five private institutions that maybe not take the SAT, SAT anymore, coastal um, test. How about just balance in the Midwest? What are you seeing or hearing from the university standpoint around the acceptance of the SAT versus the ACT? Well, the more you look at any university, they post scores for both. Um, when you talk to the college, um, when you look at Naviance, so those are Naviance is our platform that we use for um, assessment. Common App, um, it really is, it takes both scores. Um, whether it be, it, there are so many, like, I can't Essentially, imagine. we're not eliminating. No, historically the perception has been the ACT has been an in-state test and SAT was a requirement you wanted to go to school out of state. And we had kids taking both yeah. um, within the school district. So, not a huge transition. The biggest benefit to the school district is the vertical alignment that gives access to getting an eighth grade that actually longitudinally can be used for data analysis uh, with the other reporting mechanisms that SAT now has. Interestingly enough, within the last few weeks, we received emails from ACT. There's a brand new suite coming out for grade eight um, because of what states are doing. Um, but all, and I'll just move back to one of the previous questions um, to where you went, Mike. Beyond just, I would say, the three states that surround us have transitioned, and it's a state requirement to take the SAT. They've done it for many of the reasons that we've been looking at. For the sheer data reporting and availability of the analysis is very different from the college board for what SAT makes available versus what ACT now has. But again, ironically, in the last two weeks, we're getting inundated with emails from ACT about here's the newer, better, bigger ACT suite that's gonna become available because they're losing states. Um, based upon what they can prove through the data points where Paul went, the new option that ACT is creating in ACT for grade eight has been the longest exchange in existence for PSAT. And because of where we're trying to go for the academic achievement goals, as well as the benchmark goal for college readiness, knowing that this new graduation requirement that's coming online for 2023 has benchmark seals that are a requirement. Kids have to have two seals in order to graduate. So we're trying to lay the foundation for the current ninth graders. What else can we do to support you to get you to these new requirements? And this just makes practical sense. It's not gonna hurt anyone because we still have a significant population of students in Albany High School that do go out of state for college and they have to take the SAT. Um, it is a requirement. How many of our students take both? Yeah. Do we have that number? Shirley, do you know the percentage off the top of your head? I don't know sitting here, so. Okay, last year. Um, our graduating from that same class, we might have had 60 to 80 kids take the SAT, um, somewhere around that range. Of so it's plus or minus out of 375. So, um, and again, most of them are going to out of state schools. That's the reality. How about other um, tools that we've been using? <coughs> which tests are being used? So if you look um, in Central Ohio, we have um, Westerville, Japan, Dublin, Hilliard are all taking the SAT. Hilliard is coming on board um, for this particular school year. Um, Indian Hills and Chagrin Falls are also taking the SAT. So several of the highest achieving school districts in the state are SAT. So that was also part of the research that was done. Um, so it's really just, we have to give the assessment, it's requirement by state statute. It's just making a transition to go from ACT to SAT. No, it's great. Well, the Khan Academy Suite is a whole other option that ACT can't currently compete with. Um, again, personalized so that Paul gets his AC or SAT scores back, and then he can actually go into Khan, enter that from the test window to the test window, and actually have access to four to five months of planned um, enrichment or intervention, depending on Paul's score, um, and likely in, um, enrichment, so that he can actually do better the next time he takes the SAT. Question. <laughs> so we have to do parent education so we're just gonna that's all part of this because we have to help people understand um, but it's just the reality of making the transition but we think it's in the best interest of our kids um, so it will be a change for 2019 2020 but again we think it's a positive change um, that we can substantiate based upon all the data and analysis
piece. On the Board of Education agenda this evening, um, we actually have an action item for the Board of Education to take um, action to enter into a lease agreement that's been proposed by the City of New Albany. So I'm going to take a step backwards to help you get to the point where we're actually taking action related to a lease agreement. So as you may be aware, over the course of the last 18 to 24 months, there's been active conversations within our greater community related to the construction of an amphitheater and the solicitation of private donations um, through the New Albany um, Community Foundation to try to help support um, expanding the arts in New Albany, specifically in relationship to an amphitheater. So um, there was money that was provided in the last state biennial budget. There was a million dollars that was given to the city of New Albany to contribute towards the future development of an amphitheater. And after that first million, um, the New Albany Community Foundation was very active in trying to continue to solicit private or other public donations towards the development of an amphitheater. Pleased to share with you tonight that last Monday at City Council, a week ago, um, it was proposed um, to move forward as a formal project. So this is where we now get involved because um, I know the Board of Education is aware of this, but the public may not be aware of this. The physical location of the amphitheater is actually going to be on school district property. That's the purpose of tonight's action item that's requested to the Board of Education. Um, the City of New Albany will eventually be the owner of the amphitheater. However, it's starting through the New Albany Community Authority. So you might remember when the McCoy was actually built 10 years ago as a partnership between the city, the township, and the school district, it actually went through the construction process as the New Albany Community Authority. So the New Albany Community Authority will again be the going through the process to construct the amphitheater, and it's going to physically be located between New Albany Middle School and the McCoy Center um, for the Arts. So it's the green space adjacent to Dublin Granville Road. That property is owned by the school district. So tonight on the board agenda, based upon the work with the city over the course of the last probably six months um, with Mr. Stefanoff and members of his team, um, we've effectuated a lease agreement for 50 years with the city of New Albany, between the city of New Albany and the Board of Education, to allow the city to construct through the New Albany Community Authority. Um, once it's constructed, ownership would be transferred to the city of New Albany. Um, the city of New Albany will become responsible for actually ownership of the facility and maintaining and operating the facility um, in cooperation with other entities, but they are the owner. Um, current conversations, much like the McCoy, it could end up being Kappa that becomes the managing partner um, of the facility, similar to what we do currently within the free owners agreement related to the Jeannie B. McCoy Center for the Arts. So as you can see in the physical green space, the construction's actually in the center point um, between the middle school and um, the Jeannie B. McCoy Center. It will fit on that green space um, with some um, infringement into our parking lot for the first row. So the dead end, head end parking in the first row will be impacted because of the current design related to the loading dock. So there's at least eight parking spaces that will be eliminated um, within that specific space on district property um, that we're in agreement with based upon the capacity within the lot. We feel comfortable that it's not creating any hardship to the school district and we'll move forward with the design through MKSK that the city's proposing um, through the New Albany Community Foundation um, and the Community Authority at large. Um, on the next slide, this is actual physical rendering of the amphitheater, so you can actually see a picture of what it's going to look like um, in the proposal. It is a $7 million plus or minus facility um, that will fit within that green space um, based upon the 10% grade coming off of Dublin Granville Road, again, all the way back into the middle school parking lot. And this is the middle school parking lot back here. The middle school sits here, Judy B. McCoy sits here. The intent is there'll be connectivity between the McCoy Center and the amphitheater um, once it's put into the physical green space so that people can traverse back and forth um, between the two facilities based upon weather. Current conversations um, based upon the discussions I've had with the city of New Albany and Craig Moore at the New Albany Community Foundation is that we're prepping for construction to begin in September. So construction currently in all conversations would begin in September, and it's on an accelerated schedule to be completed in August of 2020. So it is a one calendar year project from start to finish, provided all goes well. Um, so we are prepped right now. So if you've been in the McCoy Center parking lot today for the middle school, 
because um, it will reopen tomorrow with the opening of Dublin Ramble Road. The last two rows of that parking lot are currently closed. We're prepping for the fact that that will become construction staging because the intent is that once the construction on the facility actually begins, Dublin Granville Road will remain open. So the roadway will be open during the entire construction project. To allow that to happen, we gave up 40 plus parking spaces in the parking lot, knowing that one road was already gonna be impacted. And based upon current parking capacity in that lot, we were able to give them the additional road for construction staging um, as part of the project. So the interior look, this is just a broad based look so you can actually see the pergola and what's happening within the plaza itself, the amphitheater and the state um, seating that's gonna be available. Um, this is just one of the renderings that MKS gave provided through Mr. Stefanov, just so you have some picture of what it's gonna to start to look like um, as the City of New Albany and the New Albany Community Foundation move forward with this. Um, it was unanimously approved by City Council. Marlene Brisk is here this evening as a council member. I'm confident that she would be happy to answer any questions you may have that would be directed towards City Council and not me. Um, but I will be happy to give you any background information as well. But the action item on tonight's agenda is actually to execute to move forward so that construction can begin in September to agree to a 50-year lease with the City of New Albany to use the green space between the McCoy Center and the Middle School um, for the terms of $10. Um, we basically are executing the same lease agreement that we have for the middle school baseball fields that sit adjacent to the intermediate school um, that we have with the City of New Albany. So it's the, really the reciprocity of the agreement we currently have um, to give them green space for in turn in kind green space that we also use for interscholastic athletics and middle school. So we have a great partnership. I highly recommend that we move forward. Um, it's a great project for our community. It will benefit the arts in New Albany as well. Our students will have access to the amphitheater. That's been part of the conversation that's been envisioned um, and hopefully create an arts festival in the future in New Albany that specifically uses Rose Run Park. Um, the amphitheater, the McCoy Center, and school district property um, for a future arts festival that will be coming to New Albany. With that, I'm gonna be quiet. If you have any questions for me or questions for Mrs. Brisk, since she happens to be sitting here as a council member. Great partnership, very good. Great, Great to meet you. Beautiful. Next on the agenda are board policies. So you have um, a significant list of board policies. These are part of my summer reading and updates and activities. So we're in the 2000 series. Um, you have three board policies specifically for review that have annual statutory or biannual statutory requirements for review. So we have that obligation um, through the work that's been completed within the last month. Um, we have several policies related to um, the 2000 series for um, board policy for minor revisions um, or name changes based upon statutory changes or updates, both from the state of Ohio or from the feds, um, in order to continue to be eligible um, for the minimal funding that we could receive from those entities. And then lastly, based upon changes in statute, there are four policies that are actually moving forward for rescindment um, from the board policy itself. So again, there's lots of things tonight and series related to board policy. There's minimal changes. Some of it is wordsmithing just based upon statutory wording that changed that we had to update policies for. Um, but we have done a comprehensive review of the 2000 series and they are presented this evening for your information review and um, action at the next formal meeting. since we met early in July 
It's actually a fairly extensive personnel list just because we have not met for um, nearly four weeks. Um, so all those personnel action items are coming forward this evening. Um, for your actions, um, we will be successful in starting the 2019-20 school year. We are still actively looking for food service workers and Eagle's Nest workers. Um, we hire Eagle's Nest Food Educational Service Center um, in Central Ohio. We need approximately seven more people for before and after school care um, that we are in the market for. And as of this morning, we have at least seven openings in food service. Um, and then we had a late resignation this afternoon for an educational assistant. So um, it's just the reality of hiring. So we are not fully staffed for 2019-20. We have substitutes lined up for Thursday and Friday. Um, and open active interviews will continue. Under general business this evening, we have approval of senior waivers, um, as well as the approval of foreign exchange students. We have four students joining us currently. There's a fifth one in the pipeline that we're waiting for final approval on based upon um, clearance of the visa, but um, I believe she will still be here by Monday. The four countries currently represented are Switzerland, Denmark, Norway, and Germany, and they have host families here in New Albany. You have approval action items for the purchase of a 77 passenger school bus, as well as two additional special needs buses. The two special needs buses are planned for through IDAD federal funding, um, and then the 77 passenger bus is part of the PI um, general revenue purchase um, that is planned for by the school district. Um, the other action item, um, our standard related to student teaching agreements um, and or student placements. We have an MOU with National Geographic that's on the agenda this evening. Um, thanks to the efforts of Sandy Reed at the E3 lab, um, she's become a National Geographic Society certified teacher and we have the opportunity to host geo inquiry um, for 30 plus teachers on our school campus this year as a result of her success. Um, and her recognition by National Geographic. So it's an incredible professional development opportunity that National Geographic is providing um, for our teachers that will ultimately benefit our students. The approval of the ground lease to the amphitheater I just previously spoke about, as well as the approval of the 2019-20 um, bus stops across the school district. Um, I will note that um, in accordance with Board of Education policy, based upon the capacity of the fleet, I am recommending the continuation of eligibility for all grade three, five, K through five students, regardless of the two mile rule, because of capacity on the buses, we will continue to transport all students K-5 um, for 2019-20 and all students grades six through 12 um, will adhere to the two mile radius required by board policy. Letter C, this could be for board resolution, um, the recommendation from Ms. Jenkins and myself, we go through the competitive bid process um, for energy services to the school district um, we're recommending an extension of the award to direct energy business based upon the um, competitive bids that were received in cooperation with the other school districts that participate in the competitive bid um, that goes out to all the different electrical companies to see who will actually get our energy business. Um, our recommendation is that direct energy services continue to receive that award based upon the competitive bid that was received. Letter D is an update to board policy and letter E are the transportation um, reimbursements for payments in lieu of. These are the students that we did not transport from private charter non-public school districts during the 2018-19 school year that actually filed for the reimbursement that they're eligible to receive under our revised code. Um, so upon approval this evening, these um, persons um, will receive their payment that were required to pay $275 per student for the entire school year because we do not transfer them because it isn't transport them because it isn't practical um, under the ruling by our higher code. Any questions? All right, if no questions, may I have a roll call? Jimmy Yes. Mr. Bush? Yes. Sergeant McCollin? Yes. That brings us to um, our closing item and I motion for adjournment. I move. Second. Mr. Bush, second by Mr. Newmoff. Roll call, please. Mr. Bush? Yes. Mr. Newmark? Yes. Uh, President Yes. Uh, we are adjourned. Our next meeting is August 